All right. This week we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <laughs> I think we're going to skip those kind of. We don't have a focus lesson in those. I don't believe. I think we do next week. I think we're in five or six next week. But we're in four. We were in two last week. We skipped in three. So to speak. Right? In three, he just says that... Uh, that Jesus <laughs> and the work that he did on the cross and providing us with salvation, right, is a whole lot better deal than what the Jews had with Moses, <laughs> basically, right? Much, much more glory in this deal because we actually get saved, <laughs> literally saved through Jesus, right? Now, if I was to talk about general revelation versus special revelation, do you know what I'm talking about? No. Mm-hmm. Well, special revelation is just the Word of God, the Bible. God give, revealing and telling us specifically a whole lot of information. General revelation is God revealing himself to us through his work, such as the creation, <laughs> When you look at the heavens, the stars, and everything, you know, and all the, the the unbelievable complexity of everything, and how it all works, you know, together, and even the human body, the complexity of the human body, or the brain, and how, you know, just how anybody could be a, a medical doctor and get a glimpse into the complexity of the human body and think that it all happened by accident, <laughs> you know. That's just ridiculous. You know, and God tells us, you know, in, in Psalms 19, 1 and 2, about him creating everything. And then in Romans 1, 20 to 23, right, Paul writes saying, all you got to do is look around, right, and you have no excuse. <laughs> the general revelation of God through his creation is enough for anybody to know that God exists and that you need him. <laughs> right? But the special part of the special revelation is what we call the good news, the gospel. The gospel means the good news, that Jesus Christ, God himself, came to earth, (laughs) right, was tortured, suffered, died on the cross, and rose again on the third day so that we can be saved and live eternally with him, right? That's the special, special revelation, right? And that's what Paul has been preaching. That's what it's all about. Now, in the first three verses or so, we've got, you know, verse 4, the God of this world. You know, Satan has blinded people to the good news, right? It's amazing how we can let ourselves be deceived because our flesh wants to be more in control, We want to be the God of our life, right, rather than for Christ to be our Lord. But, you know, Paul, in this letter, you know, you remember how he was defending his apostleship? And so he's explaining all this thing. Remember, he's talking to the church at Corinth and the surrounding areas, right? You know, he's explaining this to Christians, Christians that he was responsible for, or the tool of God, of course, God's the one ultimately responsible for bringing these people into the kingdom, right? And in verse 5, he says, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. Sometimes we go through that when we read Christ Jesus as Lord, and we don't stop to think about what it just said. Who is Jesus? Son. The Son of God. It says Christ. What does Christ mean? Anointed one. Anointed one. Yeah. The Messiah, right? <laughs> right? So this is Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord. <laughs> right? 
you know, when you start putting these titles of God together here, you know, if you just stop and think about them, or instead of just reading them, you know, it's amazing what it, how it affects your mind. <laughs> right? Christ Jesus is Lord. So he's preaching the good news. Jesus crucified. <laughs> right? And ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. Because obviously we are the benefactor when we get saved. You know, it's a big plus for us. But it's also a plus for Jesus. That's why Jesus died. So we could be, right? If it wasn't a big deal, he wouldn't have had to come, would he? He wouldn't have had to suffer and died. So for Jesus' sake, for God who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And who's Christ again is what? The anointed one, the Messiah, right? You know, now, where do we read about light shining out of darkness? Genesis. Genesis, right, exactly. All right, so we have in uh, Genesis 1, right, Verse 3, by the way. This light was created before the sun and the stars. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> God created light. Then he created the stars. We think light's dependent upon the stars. Most people. Right? Well, the light that we see is dependent on the sun. But in reality, it's just simply dependent upon God. Yeah. God created it, and then he created the sun. <laughs> so light existed before the sun. Right? So we have here a description in verse 5, you know, of the creativeness of God, right? We're talking about how God created everything, right? And, and then... The salvation from God. You know, the light shown in the darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts. Now, because of the good news, because of Jesus, we have the light in our hearts, right? Who's in your heart? If you're a Christian, who's in your heart? Jesus. Yeah, or quote unquote, his other self, the Holy Spirit, <laughs> right? One and the same, but different. Three persons, one God, <laughs> right? You know, so he's in your heart, right? To give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So what is the glory of God? Jesus, <laughs> right? And what are we supposed to do with this light that's in us? Let it shine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sermon on the Mount. I was thinking of the song. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I realize that, but in the Sermon on yeah. the Mount, that's what Jesus yeah. tells us to do. Yeah. Right? Let your light shine so the men may see you. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we have this treasure. In earthen vessels. What's the treasure? What do we have? Life. Life. Eternal life. The Holy Spirit of God. You realize that the Holy Spirit of God is what raised Jesus from the dead? Yeah. So the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you? The same power that rose that raised Jesus from the dead is resident in you. Ponder that for a minute. You could ponder that the rest of your life. <laughs> right? So we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You know, that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. What's an earthen vessel? We are. 
our human body, right? That's what he's talking about. Yeah, you know, in the first century, they would make these clay pots and stuff, right? And they would call them earthen vessels because they're made from clay, right? And they were kind of like the common everyday usage tools for assisting around the household, okay? Yeah, but aren't they kind of fragile? Well, how fragile is your earthen body? <laughs> It's fragile, too. <laughs> the older we get, the more fragile we know it is, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? You know? So, but we have this treasure in our earthen, our frailed, fragile bodies. Right? This tremendous treasure in something that's easy to break. And sometimes they would hide their wealth in an earthen vessel thinking nobody would look there. <laughs> you know, but that's where their treasure was. Well, God's doing the same thing with us, you know. <laughs> God himself is resident in this very frail human body, right? that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves, right? Do you have anything really good in your life that you created? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right? Well, I've got uh, three kids. Yeah. And who creates all life? <laughs> One of which is dead, but the other one's got cancer. No, I ain't doing it right here. <laughs> That's the earthen vessels. So fragile. Right? But he goes on to say, we have been afflicted in every way. That word afflicted... From the Greek, if you were to translate that into English today, you would really come up with something like our saying, that you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, <laughs> yeah. right? Prohibited from doing the things you want to do, you know, but not crushed. <laughs> you're stuck in between them, but you're not crushed. We're perplexed. Are you ever perplexed? <laughs> you ever not understand? You ever go to a preacher with... Ever go to a preacher with something like, my daughter has cancer, why did this happen? He doesn't have any answer. Well, does, well, well, well nothing, as, nothing as serious as Jerry's, but every time I drive to work and I cross people's paths, I'm thinking, how is it you're still alive? That perplexes me. Yeah. There's a lot of things about life that is perplexing. <laughs> The old saying, why do good things happen to bad people? <laughs> why do bad things happen to good people? Right? There's a lot of things that are perplexing. Right? But not despairing. What happened to Paul when he was tortured and put in prison? He and Silas. What were they doing? Singing. Singing. Praying and singing praises to God. <laughs> Perplex the guards. <laughs> yeah. It kind of perplexes me. Yeah. And I've been studying the Bible for I don't know how many decades. <laughs> You'd think I would know better. <laughs> right? But not despairing. Persecuted. But not forsaken. Has Paul ever been persecuted? In chapter 11 of this very same book, starting in verse 23, he says, As our servants of Christ, I speak as if insane, I more so, far more in labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received the Jewish 39 lashes. Do you know why 39? Oh. 
because they figured 40 would kill you. <laughs> They're a form of chemotherapy, Jerry. <laughs> Take you as close to death as they can, right? Five times, 39. Can you imagine what his back must have looked like after five times of 39 lashes? Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I've spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers of, of rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. <laughs> right? Do you think he understands persecution? Persecuted, but not forsaken. And why did Paul go through all that? Because he had this little meeting on the road to Damascus. <laughs> where the Lord God himself, Jesus Christ, appeared to him. Right? And thus convinced him that he was God. <laughs> and he said, and I've got an assignment for you. That would certainly get your attention. It got his, didn't it? He flipped 180 degrees right there on the spot. Went from a persecutor <laughs> to, in essence, a persecutee. <laughs> didn't he? Right? Struck down, but not destroyed. All kinds of bad things happen to you. Quote, struck down. Like in Paul's case, getting stoned and left for dead. Where he says, I went to the third heaven. <laughs> Probably was dead. God sent him back. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus told us to pick up your cross and follow me. Paul's saying persecution is really a standard issue deal with being a Christian. Because we now identify with Jesus who was persecuted. We won't get it the way he got it. And in our country we are blessed beyond measure. <laughs> What's the worst persecution we've ever had? I don't know, but that's a heck of a sales tool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't imagine trying to use. Well, but what do you get in the end? This is what Paul's pointing out. <clears throat> what he gets, but that if you know you're going to be persecuted from now on because... Christians you, all over the world are persecuted. you got to think about... You know, that's... But that's the way it is. All around the world, Christians, if you become a Christian, you know that you're going to get it. It's coming to you big time. But if you're in a Muslim country or a communist country, right? Or uh, during the so-called Inquisition, right? All you had to do was be in a Catholic country. <laughs> Right. And you get persecuted. You become a Christian, you get persecuted. Mm -hmm. It's a standard deal. Like I say, we're spoiled rotten here in the United States. But you know what? Where the church is persecuted the most, it grows the fastest. Well, it seems to be the case in China, but I don't know about here. Yeah, but we don't have persecution. That's my point. We will. It, we're heading that way, aren't yeah. we? We're heading that way. The uh, state legislature in California is entertaining a new law that if you have traditional views on sexuality, they're going to outlaw that. Mm -hmm. That will be illegal. Mm -hmm. I heard about that. <laughs> traditional views on what? Sexuality. Okay. One man, one woman for life, right? That will now be illegal to have that opinion in California. If that law passes, <laughs> uh, well, they want to succeed. Maybe they should. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> you know, 
The point being is that, and this is the point that we're bringing out, in the body we have the dying of Jesus. We get that persecution. We get this all this bad stuff going on that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in the body. Because when you've got the earthen vessel and you've got your treasure inside and the earthen vessel gets broken, what do you see? You see the treasure. The treasure. Yeah. And the treasure with us is the Spirit of God. So when Jesus is on the cross, did he lash out at the people that were persecuting him and killing him? When Paul was being stoned, etc., right? And imprisoned, beaten, right? What you see then is Jesus. And that's why the church grows. When people see people suffering, but still, quote unquote, right? Not forsaken, not destroyed, not despairing, right? True Christians realize this is something that was part of the deal. <laughs> so we don't like to talk about that, you know, in our country, you know, because we don't see that kind of persecution, at least to this point, right? Why? You know, but when the body is broken, now you see the life of Jesus. For we who are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Break the vessel and see the treasure. It comes back to that song Carmen did, right? When people see a true Christian living the life of a Christian, other people are like, well, I want some of that. <laughs> and the song was called Some of That. <laughs> I want some of that. So death works in us. So as Paul's saying, I've been persecuted, right? But God kept me going, right? So I could come here and witness to you, and now, but life in you. The Corinthians have Jesus because Paul made it through. <laughs> Paul made it through because of God. Right, But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke, we also believe, therefore also we speak. He's quoting Psalms 116 right there. You know, the New Testament is predominantly quotes from the Old Testament, mm. just applied to Jesus. <laughs> mm. Right? knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. So why do we go through the persecution? Why do we buy into the deal? Because eternal life awaits us. Right? You know, Eternal life with Jesus, when he says raised also with Jesus, that implies the second coming again. Right? For all things are for your sakes, that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. And the more we go through this, the more we witness, the more people accept Jesus, Right? to the glory of God, who's providing for all of us to be that way. Verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart, right? We persevere. But through our outer man is decaying, we know about that, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. <laughs> you know, when you become a Christian, you become a new creature, <laughs> This inner you has been transformed, right? And someday we'll have a new glorified body, okay? After when Jesus comes a second time. For momentarily, light affliction. So, momentarily. <laughs> this persecution that we suffer here on earth, 
compared to eternity is not even a blink of the eye, right? Momentarily, we have light. Would, would we describe Paul's persecution as light? <laughs> But when you compare it to eternity with Jesus, suddenly it be, seems light, doesn't it? It's a, certainly a big, big deal when it's happening. But compared to eternity <laughs> in heaven with Christ, it's a minor, minor price to pay. And he's pointing out that you, you should expect it. <laughs> you should expect some kind of persecution to go with the deal. Like saying, most Christians around the world, you get it really bad. Mm-hmm. Here in the U.S., we, we got a cakewalk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you still complain, don't we? <laughs> right? Well, momentarily, light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. <laughs> right? While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. Right? So we have a temporary situation where we're likely to be persecuted because we walk with Jesus. But we have an eternal situation, (laughs) right? Where we'll be with Jesus forever starting with our thousand-year reign here on earth, (laughs) right? And all we have to do is accept what what God's done for us. Jesus already came and suffered and died on the cross for us. What, What should we not do for him? Well... I don't know, every once in a while you think about things that you're not supposed to think about. <laughs> what? You still live in that fleshly nature? Yeah. Well, thank Adam for that. <laughs> we all got it. <laughs> right? But that's what gets you in trouble. It gets you in trouble. There's no, <laughs> no doubt about that. <laughs> right? <laughs> And unfortunately, God looks at those thoughts too. If you look on a woman to lust, you've already sinned in your heart. (laughs) Well, that's not the problems I'm I'm dealing with. (laughs) (laughs) So even those thoughts, though, see, are problematic. Mm -hmm. Not not just what you do, it's what you think. Mm -hmm. Right? But, Paul tells us, right, take every thought captive. Just because a thought comes into your mind doesn't make it sin. It's what you do with it next. Well, I've never acted on it, so I don't believe I ever will. Well, not necessarily. I like to make the thoughts go away. It's just like when you walk out on the balcony and look down and there's Bathsheba bathing, right? If you just walk out, look down and see her, and you're like, oh, and you go back inside, you didn't sin. Now, if you hang around for a while, <laughs> and, st- and your mind and your mind starts running, right? Imagine what I would be saying. You know, when King David said, "Bring that woman up here," <laughs> right? He obviously hung around too long. Yeah. And what was the consequence of that? He ended up killing her husband. Killing her husband. One of his best friends. Mm-hmm. One of his best generals. His mighty, one of his mighty 30, right? Uriah, right? Because he didn't turn around and go back inside. He didn't take every thought captive. <laughs> you know, now, I'll admit I don't do a very good job of that either. Yeah. I need to do a lot better job. <laughs> you know, all kinds of thoughts go through your mind, and say, and a lot of them are not from God. <laughs> some of them are from the devil, and some of them you just jump, you just pop up yourself. Well, it sure would be nice if you didn't have 
And that day is coming. When we get to heaven, we won't have those kinds of thoughts. We won't have this fleshly nature anymore. But we may not be able to get there. Once you're a Christian, no. Once you're saved, you're saved, regardless. You can't, God will not let go of you. Nobody can take you out of his hands. It does work. God said it works that way. (laughs) Right? No one can take you out of my hand. (laughs) Right? Not to mention, like I said, you become a Christian, you become a new creature. And somebody will say, well, you can sin and lose your salvation. Well, how are you going to unchange yourself? How are you going to do that? You didn't change yourself to begin with. You accepted Christ. He changed you. He's not going to unchange you. (laughs) Right? You are his from that moment on, period. No matter what happens next. Now, can he get upset with you like Ananias and Sapphira and just take you to heaven? (laughs) Take you off the earth? He could. You know? Will he allow you to suffer the consequences of some of those thoughts and decisions you make? Yep. Yep. I think you can pretty much count on that. Unfortunately, many times, there's a whole bunch of other people that suffer with you because of the sin, especially your family, right? That's one of my prayers is, Lord, if if I deserve punishment, give it to me, right? Just don't don't hurt my wife or my kids, you know, because of my stupidity. (laughs) Please protect them from me. (laughs) Like you say, we, we, we still live in this earthen vessel. We have that flesh nature which creates problems. If we focus on the bigger picture, if we focus on eternity, right, then it's a lot easier to take those thoughts captive, right, and dismiss the evil thoughts, the bad and sinful thoughts immediately and move on and get back to the big picture. You know, if if we're focused on what Jesus wants us to do instead of what we want to do, Right? If we can get our desires and wants in line with his, so what we want is what he wants, we have far fewer of those kinds of problems. You need a new book. Yeah. Right. Well, that's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Any questions or comments?